Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of BCA's Borderlands Forum. Uh, this is a really special occasion for the forum today because we're joined by Dr. Jack S. Williams. Uh, I first met Jack Williams uh, way back in middle school. Uh, my dad found a, uh, an ad in the newspaper about helping archaeologists excavate the San Diego uh, Presidio site, the Spanish colonial Presidio site, and uh, I started helping out there, uh, started volunteering, and I just fell in love uh, with everything Spanish colonial, Hispanic history, the indigenous history of the Southwest, and that's really what, what kind of led my trajectory um, to the pr profession that I'm in now um, uh, as the nonprofit program director for Border Community Alliance. And I wanted to briefly introduce uh, uh, Jack, uh, he has worked as an archaeologist and historian on various research projects in the United States, Mexico, South America, and Europe. And uh, he has a particular interest in the Native Americans and early colonization of the Southwest in California. Uh, he also holds a doctoral a degree in anthropology from the University of Arizona and has written numerous books and articles. Uh, now he's retired and he's actually joining us from South Bend, Indiana through the the virtue of technology. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Jack, for joining us today. We have a lot of Tubaqueños uh, here on the Zoom call that are uh, very interested in the, the heritage of, of this uh, important uh, community in the state of Arizona. So thank you. Well, it's a delight to be with you today. I'm talking to you from the land of snow. Um, we've had a couple of big snowstorms move in recently, so it's quite white looking outside. And um, I often, while I'm in working in my studio and in my office, think about Tupac and how warm it was even on the cold days compared to here. So um, I guess without further ado, what I'm planning to, to present today is a, a PowerPoint, which I've already recorded and I'll be playing for you, and then we'll open it up to questions following that. So. Uh, unless there's some reason for us not to, I'm going to go ahead and start the share right now. And if, every, if the technology works, we should be underway. Awesome. Well, Jack's transitioning. Um, if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to use the chat box and write them there or save them to the very end when we have the, the Q&A session. To live and die in Spanish colonial Tubac. Uh, Jack, Jack, uh, it's not showing your screen. Research and findings of the colonial Tubac archaeology project. Just as I focused on the remains of the preceding yeah. community. It's not okay. okay. Let's yeah, start. Can... Let's uh -huh. at the end of the 20th century. I a number will. of management and interpretive objectives. Including there you go. Establishing various areas okay. of the colonial okay. settlement. Let me get it back to the start. If you want to, yeah, there you go. Perfect. Spanish colonial Cuba. Is that working now? This presentation now? Yes. concerns the research and findings of the colonial Tubac archaeology project. This effort was focused on the remains of the Presidio community found in Tubac, Arizona. It took place at the end of the 20th century. It had a number of management and interpretive objectives, including establishing various areas of the colonial settlement gaining an understanding of the changes in daily life in the outpost over time. Of course, Tubac Presidio was a location of a Presidio, which is a kind of military colony. This is a map showing the distribution of Presidio communities across the Northwest of what was then the Sonoran frontier. Tubac has a complicated history. There was a large prehistoric component to the site, although the major focus of it was not on the area later occupied by the Presidio. In the historic period, there was a occupation associated with a mission outpost between about 1730 and 1751. And then in 1752, the establishment of the Presidio of San Ignacio del Tubac, which lasted until 1776. And briefly, there was a Pueblo or town of Tubac between 1776 and 1783. And then a new Presidio was relocated to Tubac, known as the Presidio de San Rafael de Buenavista at Tubac. 
and that ended in 1848. And finally, in 18, around 1852 until about 1854, there was a military fuerte at Tubac. Part one, the research project. The project succeeded in establishing the extensive remains of the Presidio. Much of the work concentrated on the southern portion of the site, termed the South Barrio. The area was initially threatened by development. Thanks to the generosity of Roy Ross, the landowner, much of it was eventually set aside for preservation. Fortunately, in our investigations at Tubac, there are extensive records of the historic period, including many documents such as these, which are part of a, an inspection that was done in 1775 by Hugo O'Connor. Probably the most important single documentary evidence we have is of the plan of the settlement created by a Spanish military engineer named Jose de Urrutia. And his plan, which is one of about a dozen showing frontier posts along the northern frontier, shows the complete layout of the settlement and identifies various important features of the site location. Our investigations determined that much of this map is extremely accurate. And it looks like that probably most of the buildings are in the location shown here down to probably two or three meters from their actual location. The features shown on the Urutia map included the Presidio Chapel, the Commandant's house or Casa del Capitan, the North Barrio, and of course Barrio just means neighborhood, and the South Barrio two house clusters on two adjacent hills. One of the most important things we were able to recognize early on in our investigations was that the environment had changed a lot from the colonial period. And it was quite clear that initially this area was covered by a short grass biome. And that had given way to a man-built environment, which included fields and much of the vegetation, especially anything that was wooden, was cut down and used as fuel for construction. And so the hills were fairly barren, except for the man-made uh, fields areas. And then finally, in the late 19th century, the grazing of cattle introduced huge amounts of mesquite pods to the area. They cattle eat mesquites and they defecate the seeds. And these grew up into a very thick mesquite bosque, which currently still covers much of the site. Much of our effort focused on the South Barrio. Our work established the presence of extensive ruins and features that confirmed the general accuracy of the Arutia plan. We also saw very many buildings that were not shown on the plan that were constructed later, a few that may have been constructed earlier, and uh, just a miscellaneous of, of human agency activities are shown in evidence in the area. In addition to the South Barrio, a number of studies were undertaken in the northern half of the site, the North Barrio, including at the Catherine's house and various other locations. Here you can see a modern view, a plan of Tubac showing the location of the North and South Barrios. All the excavations were undertaken using a one by one meter grid and hand tools. All the recovered soil was screened using one eighth inch mesh hardware cloth. The collections are now located at the Arizona State Museum. We can see an example of our excavation methods, excavating a one by one meter unit and screening all the soil um, as it was extracted from the ground. Here we see a view of some of our investigations at the captain's house. At the time, um, the private family owned about a third of the captain's house and they allowed us to investigate it. And uh, we focused on the guard house and the plaza area and excavated a few rooms of a larger rectangular structure. Another important structure that we discovered in the South Barrio was called, we named Structure One or 101. Um, it, it consisted of a large fortified house complex um, with a lot of artifacts distributed across the surface of a very shallow deposit. And it later turned out the structure was probably constructed after the initial Presidio period and um, included a lot of evidence of mining activities. 
probably the most prominent feature in the South Barrio architecturally that we investigated was the Casa Escondida, the hidden house. It was essentially in a mesquite bosque and there was very little evidence on the surface of, it, of its existence, but a number of very widely distributed colonial artifacts and we followed up with an archeological excavation and of course determined that it was a, in fact, two different structures superimposed on each other, both of which probably dated to the first Presidio period. Here we can see a top a plan uh, kind of view of the excavations. Another important structure that we excavated was structure five. Structure five turned out to be fairly typical of the adobe structures of the South Barrio. It consisted primarily of a cobble foundation. There were very few artifacts in or around the structure and probably dated to the first Presidio period. The most productive area of the site was a location we named East Midden in the South Barrio. The deposit was adjacent to a small rise above the floodplain. It contained hundreds of thousands of colonial artifacts, including ceramics, domestic animal bones, jewelry, and a small number of coins. Here we are working at the East Midden. And these are just a few examples of kind of things we recovered, um, burned corn cob, shoe buckle, some gun furniture, a small copper bronze milagro, some clothes and a earring, fragments, bronze religious metal, a silver symbol, and a pectoral crucifix. We also import in an important way, discovered the location of the Asakia. Uh, on both North and South Barrio, we were able to find um, this was essentially a ditch running along the edge of the floodplain. And um, by good fortune, the test in the South Barrio also disclosed a structure that was cut in half by the Asakia, and that probably were the remains of a structure that dated to before the construction of this waterwork system and probably dated back to the beginnings of the mission, the Zita. Here we see the Asakia as it cuts through the South Barrio, and you can see the, the uh, post holes that are associated with that structure that Chosa that I was talking about, probably was a part of the mission of the Zita. Now we're going to take a look a little bit at what we learned about daily life at the Presidio. The data that we recovered presented a complex perspective of daily life in early Tuba. The people's existence settlement was neither a heaven or a hell. It was a place where complicated societies confronted each other in episodes that were sometimes friendly and sometimes violent. It may be useful to note that the individuals who lived in early Tuba had no idea of how their stories would appear to future generations. They did not see their actions in terms of a pastoral utopia, the confrontation of cultures are the ideologies of humanism, sexism, racism, or colonialism. These notions remained invisible to them. The story of Tubac is frequently presented in terms of two mutually exclusive extremes. On the one hand, Spanish colonial and Mexican Pimaria Alta have been sometimes presented as a long romantic interlude where settlers and Indians existed in a folk culture and created a peaceful land of plenty. An alternative view emphasizes the importance of the Apache Wars and the colonial aggression by the newcomers. Some authors have attempted to portray this period as a horrible case of dystopia. Early Tubac has been reduced to a narrative of warfare, oppression, and slavery. Instead, we found the frontier people existed in a world where the challenges of just surviving were at the core of much of everyday life. Now I'm going to take a closer look at one aspect of material culture because there are so many, literally um, hundreds of thousands of objects recovered. It'd be impossible in a talk like this to cover all of them. So instead I'm going to focus a little bit on the architecture of the site. The architecture of the site reflects the patterns of existence in the colonial era. A number of different styles of construction were exposed by the archeological investigations. 
These reveal the complexity and variability of frontier vernacular architecture. Here shows the distribution of this is a model I built showing the South Barrio and the North Barrio and various key features, including the commander's house, the church, and the roadway. We found the fortified captain's house had evolved dramatically over time with shifting floor plans and structural orientations. This is a cutaway of 1766, and this one in 1810 showing how dramatically different the building actually was. The original commandant's house is shown here in this yellow structure, um, was the one that appears on the Urukia map. The adobe structures, ruins, which can be seen on the surface today, are largely these orangish red lines, and they represent the later construction. You can see um, how the original building was somewhat smaller and rectilinear, while the latter one had this huge diagonal wing. And um, this building, of course, probably included some remnants of the earlier structure, um, but was primarily a construction from the 1780s or later. And here is uh, some architectural plan views I share, our, uh, projections I made of these structures from 1766, 1810, 1850, and 1880. One of the most interesting areas of the captain's house was the guard house. It included a subterranean room that appears to have been used for storage and as a jail. The only other large uh, adobe construction in Tubac was the community church, which was not investigated. Most you can say the was in on top of it. Documents established Northern Sonora was a region deeply involved in the Indian Wars. However, we found little direct evidence of warfare outside the fortified commander's house. Nearly all the people of Tubac lived in less substantial, small one or two room houses. These were built from adobe bricks and wattle and daub, acadas or chosa. The earliest evidence of architecture dating to the historic era we encountered were the remains of a pre-presidio building made from upright poles in the South Barrio, near the East Midden. It was bisected by the canal shown on the Arutia map and must have therefore dated to before 1767. The structure was probably part of the earlier mission-related settlement. The first roofs were probably thatch. Matt served as doorways. These structures caught, easily caught fire, making them dangerous for the inhabitants. In some frontier areas, posts were set in adjacent spaces, so-called palisado construction. However, this was not seen in Tuba. This was perhaps owing to the scarcity of large diameter trees. The very earliest procedural constrictions were probably crude grass structures and tents. No specific remains of these early shelters were encountered. By far and away, wattle and daub were the commonest construction materials. The resulting ephemeral structures were generally anchored to the ground with large co cobbles of upright tabular stone. Many of the structures were heated by a central hearth. Roofs, which included pitched forms and flat earth-covered azoteas, were held in place by upright poles. The floors were made of tamped earth or clay, or more rarely, adobe bricks. Adobe construction with cobble foundations were also common. Some houses had formal corner fireplaces. The corner fireplaces heated the homes, were also apparently used extensively for cooking. The components of the adobe building were similar to constructions built elsewhere on the frontier. The buildings had flat earthen roofs, azoteas, and wooden roof trains, canales. Some adobe constructions had uh, roofs held in place by upright poles, with the walls infilled with adobes instead of wattle and daub. Over time, the single residences were expanded as families grew. Adult males generally tried to live near their fathers. They were patrilocal. Over time, the buildings had multiple family residences built with adjoining walls. The resulting lineage houses reflected patrilineal family organization. The growth of the average uh, domestic structural complexes was irregular, with buildings and rooms added using more than a single kind of material. 
resulting floor plans were also irregular. A surprising amount of daily life was apparently spent on the earthen floors. The furniture items of the average settler were low to the floor, similar to those of the modern Islamic North African tradition. Carpets and mats probably covered the earthen surfaces. By modern standards, the interior furnishings of most early homes were sparse and rustic. Some of the more elaborate homes had and more substantial features, such as adobe sleeping benches, wooden beds, chairs, and tables. And finally, I mentioned the enigmatic later Plazuela house in the South Barrio Structure One, which had a wall compound and uh, some buildings lining the compound. Later, a a large um, reverberatory furnace was added, and an Orno Castellano was called, and the entire area was heavily covered with small bits of slag. Conclusions. It's very clear that the life on the Sonoran military frontier was a, was a complex mixture of um, what appeared to be by Native American standards almost luxury and, and scarcity and that it was a, neither a heaven or hell. And perhaps more importantly, we recognize in the components of this frontier culture, elements that were European, um, some that were from ancient Mexico, brought by the settlers, and also local native traditions were kind of compounded and blended in the settlement. Tubac remains very important architecturally and uh, in terms of the material culture, because it's one of a very small number of pre-Royal Regulation Presidios on the frontier that have survived and uh, have been studied archeologically. It was an important location for me to use for comparative purposes with the Royal Regulation related Presidios that I investigated in California and elsewhere. And um, it stands in really sharp contrast to the huge fortified compounds such as Tucson and Santa Cruz de Chernante that were built after the 1776 regulation. Now I'll open it up to any questions you might have. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jack. That was really illuminating. Uh, so yeah, we want to open it up. Uh, I think a lot of you are muted. So if you have a question you want to ask uh, Jack directly, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Or alternatively, there's also the chat function too, where you could type your, your questions. And I'm, I'm happy to, to, to read those off uh, from Jack as well. Jack, my first question for you would be actually, um, you know, I used to work at Timakakri National Historical Park, and one of the, the, the visits that you can make there is of the old lime kiln. Uh, is there any evidence that a lot of the buildings, the double buildings, were uh, plastered with lime, uh, perhaps the commandant's house? I had to turn that off, sorry. Uh, lime plastering. Yes, there was extensive evidence of lime plastering. It would appear that most buildings had periodic um, whitewashing with lechada, which is a mixture of goat's milk and quicklime. And uh, one of the very surprising things about the commander's house was that most of the floors were mezcla, which were, you know, are essentially a um, early form of concrete. So mm -hmm. they, they were using a lot of it there. I've looked at the kilns at, at um, at Tumacacri, and, and they're, they are pretty clearly two small kilns that were used probably for maintenance of the Tumacacri complex. Um, I had a chance to excavate a much, two other lime kilns that were really on a much more uh, dramatic epic scale. One was at uh, San Juan Capistrano in California, and one was at uh, Mission San Luis Rey. And uh, they are easy to identify because they almost always have tons of clinkers, which are partially burned limestone. So somewhere around Tumacacri, I suspect there's another really large kiln that probably corresponds to the construction phase of the, of the church there. there. There certainly was a, a very large lime kiln that I saw in 
the area of San Alvarado Bach to working on a project there north of the site, we encountered a huge, a huge kiln that was later uh, rebuilt into a couple of smaller kilns. And um, my guess in, in the community that was known as Los Reales there, but my guess is that it in fact was uh, probably associated with the construction of San Alvarado Bach. Um, so yeah, there must have been smaller ones. There were some missing pieces, I think, of the puzzle in in Tubac, which can be accounted for by later um, activities. And one is that the we found no obvious evidence of a kiln around the settlement, a lime kiln, for example. The other thing that sort of surprised me was the lack of evidence of arastras. But my my guess is, in the case of the arastras, they were later demolished as people were searching for you know, precious metal. And we did find several places where it looked like there might have been arastros, but were then ripped to pieces. Um, but I have no really good account for why the, the um, we didn't find any quick lime kilns, even small ones. We also didn't find anything that could be described as ceramic kilns in the site, which I have seen in other places. So it was kind of interesting, but I'm not sure they aren't there. I think that it's quite possible that they're simply were erased by later activities. Okay, and and just to clarify for the folks, uh, arrastras are the ore processing, um, kind of the primitive ore processing uh, um, uh, that they would do with uh, with donkeys, donkey powered, basically, right? Yeah, they can actually be human powered, but mm. uh, it's basically the patio process of of crushing ore and mixing it with a mercury amalgam. Then you extract mm. the uh, uh, the precious metal from the amalgam. And uh, there used to be tons of them in Southern Arizona, but probably, especially during the depression era, people went out and pulled them apart because you could still find traces of the uh, amalgam uh, even after a century in, in the, among the rocks. And those could be still processed for precious metal, although there was probably not much to be had. People were doing that a lot in the depression era. Um, one of the interesting things about the ore we found in, in Tubac, of course, I wasn't talking about it today, but there was plenty of evidence of the post and period town, which must have consisted largely of, I, my guess is a rather temporary wooden and canvas buildings. But in any event, the, the ore that we saw was really quite elaborate. And I had a number of mining experts look at it. And the thing they told me, which was interesting, was that it was really ore from all over Southern Arizona. And it was quite clear that they were hauling it back. And the soldiers, of course, were notorious for being as interested in um, finding mineral discoveries as they were fighting Indians. Um, but in any event, they were obviously bringing back these high-grade ores and then processing them in Tubac. My guess is to determine how much um, output metal they had. A lot of the um, ore also was a kind of Galena ore, which cannot be process using um, mercury amalgam process for some chemical reasons. And instead, um, the curious thing we found in the Plazuela, which was this reverberatory furnace, was used in essentially an ore roasting process. Um, so uh, I had never seen one of those archaeologically. I've seen a couple that were in ruins in California from much later time period. But the one we found was definitely a Spanish era construction. So it was quite amazing. Thank you, Jack. This question comes from Mary Graff, who's actually a docent at the Presidio San Agustin del, uh, del Tucson. Uh, Mary asks, what types of domestic animals did you find? By far the most common kind of obvious evidence of domestic animals was cattle bones. And so it, not surprisingly in Sonora, the huge part of the diet must have been made up of beef. We did find in much smaller amounts, uh, caprines, you know, goats and sheep. Um, we also found a fair amount of bird bones, many of which looked like domestic uh, chicken and turkeys. So those probably were the most obvious kinds of food remains we found that were animals. And as I mentioned, we did find burned corn, um, some individual kernels and some corn cobs. And we occasionally found some burned beans that looked like they were probably pinto beans. Um, so people were definitely eating the same kind of diet that has survived into the modern period in, in Sonora. Um, it, it was quite distinct and that seemed to be from the very beginning of the settlement. So 
Um, the diet, I don't think, evolved too much while they were living there. Okay. Uh, this question is from Chuck. Chuck, uh, what is the providence of the map in the roster? Oh, well, the map's location is in the British Library. It was in the British Museum. It has a very curious history. A whole bundle of these maps, which were made by Arutia, were being shipped back to Spain, and they were captured by the British. And so they ended up in the British possession. That's where they remain to this day. Um, and the document is, it's actually, I'm not sure exactly where this particular copy came from, but there are copies of this document, I think in both AGI, which is the Sevillan archive of the Indies in Spain. And also there are copies of it in the AGN collection, which is the Archivo General de la Nación in Mexico. So th that particular inspection of Tubac is, is pretty, pretty detailed. I think the particular documents I reproduced here were from the bundle that are in AGI Sevilla, or AGI Guadalajara, uh, the Gajo 272. Uh, it contains the great bulk of the Ruby inspection papers, the detailed ones, which have never been published. The, um, the overall summary of, of the inspection by Ruby and a, a separate document by Nicholas Lafora have both been published, but the original detailed uh, individual inspections have never been published. A few of them have, but none of them comprehensively. Um, Jack, the next question is from Jose Lopez. Can you speak to the 1776 regulations? The Reglamento of 1776 was a direct consequence of the inspection that had taken place by uh, Ruby and Lafora. And what they had found was the frontier was highly disorganized. The, uh, the troops were not up to the standards of regulars and the presidios for the most part were unfortified and as a consequence were not very safe places to be in view of Apache Indian raiding and Comanche Indian raiding in the East. So the regulation of 1776 had as its core a professionalization of the Spanish army on the frontier. So the Presidio soldiers were essentially changed from being essentially a kind of militia into regulars of the Spanish army. It also called for the creation of cookie cutter like fortress presidios like Tucson was and Santa Cruz de Terranante. Um, and then also it was, it was definitely an attempt to create uh, a strategic barrier, kind of like the Wa Great Wall of China as a concept, which would stretch from the Gulf of Mexico to the Gulf of California. And that belt of presidios were going to have, essentially they were gonna concentrate all the soldiers into that sort of beltway and have these fortress presidios there. And they were expected to cut off the Indians' lines of supply and communication when they tried to raid deeper into uh, North America. Of course, the problem was this was that the Apaches and the Comanches did not have lines of supply or communication. And so the regulation of 1776 in many ways turned into a fiasco in terms of strategic uh, significance. It did, however, change for the frontier population many things, not the least of which was legally. They changed their status to regulars, which gave them all sorts of special benefits, but also, it established a whole codex of laws, which are um, included in the Royal Ordinances of the Spanish Army and the specifics of the Reglamento, which included things like land grants and things like that. So it was a revolutionary moment um, on the frontier. And uh, as it strategically became obvious that it failed some aspects of it, like the idea of having this solid belt of procedures was eventually abandoned and the more detailed defense in depth and new procedures were established to get in the interior or reactivated in order to offset the continuous Indian raids. Um, but it remained more or less the document that governed life in the military frontier uh, from California to Texas uh, until the 1820s when uh, in 1826 under the Mexican Republic, a new reglamento was published. Um, and that remained in effect until 1848 when the Presidio system was officially ended, but then the time of building these Mexican fuertes, which were very similar military colonies as a concept, came into use. And that reg copies of the 1826 and the 1848 Reglamento are both in the 
Arizona Historical Society has copies of both those documents. Awesome, thank you, Jack. Um, just some comments here from Nancy from London. It is regularly debated here in the UK about returning historical artifacts to their country of origin. Our museums would be pretty empty. In any case, so far, it's not happening. And then uh, Dan Judkins says here, the plan for the line of Presidio sounds like the prototype for the quote unquote beautiful wall concept as well. <laughs> so, pretty, pretty theme. Well, it's, def it's, it's definitely the case that um, there are a lot of things in possession of nations all over Europe that were a kind of borrowed from other people. And um, it seems a pretty odd thing to me that they'd want it. I, I don't think Spain is anxious to get the maps back as long as they're well taken care of and there are digital copies available for people to use, which is the case. So it's not like the British are holding these so tightly that no one can see them. Um, they're no longer considered security issues in Britain, surprise, surprise. Um, and the, the building of the wall was actually a very interesting idea, but it's like many strategic barriers of that sort of building chains of forts and things. Um, they make a lot of sense given the technology of warfare of the time, but only if the, your opponent is consistent with like European military practices. So no one in European warfare could afford to leave behind large fortresses with garrisons at the, behind them and lines of supply and communication were important. But because of the nature of how Apaches and Comanches fought, it really wasn't relevant to them. So the whole grand design of these procedures. Also, I have to say that here's one of the ironies of Tubac and Tucson. When Tubac was constructed, it's not a fortified site, essentially. The captain's house was fortified, but most of the settlements is open buildings. But that was the time period in which Spanish were actually in the strongest position militarily. When Tucson was built, which is this you know, huge fortress, the Spanish were really losing the war pretty dramatically. And the so-called Apache peace really had nothing to do with the regulation of 1776. It really was instead a consequence of a peace initiative, which started out as an attempt to destroy the Indians through undermining their culture, but turned into a tribute paying system. And it managed to have a period of relative peace as long as the government could pay the tribute. And of course, in the Mexican Republic period, this became impossible and the Apache Wars went back to the ferocity that they had been in the earlier era. So lots of irony there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jack, are you aware if, if your, the artifacts that you've uncovered here in Tubac um, have ever been on exhibition by the Arizona State Museum? Uh, that's one of my big gripes is that oftentimes they're kind of hidden away in some deep, you know, dark corridors and uh, they rarely see the light of, of day. So the public might really kind of um, have an, a conception of what life was like and, and what you've shared with us today? Well, a small portion of the collections were exhibited at the, at the State Park Museum. Um, but to my knowledge, I've never seen any kind of attempt to present them through the Arizona State Museum and exhibits. Um, the Arizona State Museum, which I worked at for a number of years, is, is a kind of complicated place. And one of the unfortunate things is that um, more than a few objects have been taken illegally, you know, especially things like coins and anything that has any kind of obvious monetary value um, sometimes don't survive. I know I, when I looked at the collections from both uh, Tucson Presidio that had been done by the Tucson Urban Renewal Project and also uh, artifacts that were recovered from San Agustin de Tucson, which is the little mission visita at the base of A Mountain. Um, I was able to find in the records mentions of, of like coins and crucifixes, but in the collections, they don't exist anymore. And when I asked people about it, they said, well, you know, unfortunately, when researchers have gone and, and used the collection, some of them, you know, had unethical purposes and ended up taking them. So I really don't know how much has survived. I have a comprehensive collection of both the field notes and the records. We did a preliminary analysis of the artifacts. So we have counts from pretty much all the locations. When the collections were transferred to the Arizona State Museum, they said they were going to give me an inventory, but that has never materialized. So 
It's a real shame. Um, Rick Hansen asks, in, in the midden, what changed over time in the artifacts recovered? Well, this was a fascinating part of the question that we started out with thinking that maybe we could see some obvious things in the distribution that changed over time um, of objects by either percentage or type or variety. In terms of the ceramics, you could definitely see that towards the end of the second presidio period, the, the ceramics were largely, um, the imported ceramics were, were predominantly of European and British origin. Um, moving back into the presidio, Video era proper, the um, types of, for example, Loza Blanca de Puebla or Maiolica was pretty consistent through the whole time period. Uh, there were some of the more common early types were clearly more associated with the first Presidio occupation. So things like um, San Agustin, uh, blue on white and a few, few types like that. We didn't see any Lacey Puebla polychrome, which was characteristic of the earlier period, but it, the, um, the decorated wares were a very tiny percentage. One of the things we did find that was really, I think, interesting was Hank Dobbins had suggested that most of the luxury associated ceramics like Chinese porcelains and Maiolica should be concentrated in the captain's house. And that was not the case. It looks like everybody living in the settlement <clears throat> down to the average soldier um, had a similar array of luxury goods available to them and, and used them. Um, so there may have been very obvious differences in like house furnishings and the amount of space a person has for living space. But what there wasn't was uh, like all the really amazing objects were concentrated at the commander's house. That didn't happen. Um, so it, it was interesting. And this is also a pattern I've seen elsewhere which is that the uh, quantities of imported goods and the amount of iron and copper and everything else objects really suggest that the average soldier lived a life that had a lot more access to luxury goods than say the neophytes at, at Tumacacri or San Javier del Bach. But um, what we didn't see was that the, the elite who were clearly socially quite apart from the garrisons had in their possession more luxury items. So everybody seemed to sh share and share alike in this community. It was amazing. Every so once in a while, we would run into something. Like I remember we found a coin, uh, half real from uh, 1768 or something like that. And I thought, well, this one object that I held in my hand probably had been in the hand of Juan Bautista de Anza. And that was exciting to think about. Of course, um, the Commandant's house, the story of that building, one of the interesting things, it was built as a private residence by Felipe Bedaran, who was the first Commandant. And it had been acquired by Anza. I think he had purchased it from Bedaran. And um, it remained at his private residence into the Pueblo period. So even after he'd gone moved on to Tucson and gone on the expeditions and things, that was still his home. But when he passed away, he left that building to the government. And from that point on, it became a government building. So the second Presidio period really sees it not as a private residence, but as a combination of garrison building and commander's house. And it remained so through the rest of the Spanish and Mexican period. And of course, it was later used by Post and then, you know, survived into the 1880s as a semi-ruined building, but was around. One interesting thing about that building was the Torreon, which is often shown in paintings and drawings for reconstructions, did not exist during the uh, period of Anza. It's a later construction. And um, it's not on top of the guardhouse, which is at the opposite end of the compound. So it's there's an awful lot of stuff which is entered to literature and in illustrations, which are just pretty, pretty awful in terms of accuracy. So do you expect, uh, uh, suspect the tower was added when it was the, the Pima uh, Auxiliary uh, Presidio or later than that? No, I think it was probably added in the 1780s, 1780s. when they rebuilt the structure. Because what happened at the end of the Pueblo, the town period um, before 1782 was that the, the settlement was virtually abandoned because once the garrison was pulled out, the Apache raids really intensified. And so the population, which was hoped would have formed a militia and been able to defend the place, couldn't. They all left, headed for Tucson largely and to some other places in Northern Sonora. Um, 
but the town went into ruins. And my guess is when it was in a semi-ruined condition, anything that was wooden and it was burned and um, anything that could be of any value that could be carried off was removed. So when they came back to rebuild the Presidio uh, at the same site, they, they were able to use probably some of the building materials, but as a whole, I think like the commander's house was probably a terrible ruin, uh, semi-demolished. And that's certainly what the evidence was from what we saw. Uh, one of the curious things we discovered was in that sort of basement-like structure under the guardhouse, which was probably uh, functionally a dungeon, um, the, the roof had collapsed on that structure. So we found on the floor trash that had been thrown in there at the end of the first Presidio occupation. And then we found the roof fabric. And then on top of the roof fabric, we found a scattering of artifacts, which must have been on the roof of the, of the commander's house originally. And what they really suggested was that, not too surprisingly, people lived on the roofs of their houses in Sonora at that time, partly because it was a safe, a relatively safe place to be. And also no one in their right mind wanted to, 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 to sleep in one of those adobe or wall and daub structures in the summertime. And as you can imagine, it must have been unbearably hot. And um, so people just went up and lived on the roofs, which was uh, a pattern that we see among native peoples in New Mexico, but also all across the North and in Europe as well, in North Africa, so. Yeah, and uh, going back to your statement about Baldarrain, the first Presidio com Commandant of Tubac Presidio, uh, I believe he's buried at, in Guavavi, uh, and I think he died from a mortal wound of a Seri poison-tipped uh, arrow, if, I, if I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, another another Basque uh, officer uh, here on the northwest frontier. Um, I think yeah, I think also on, on the is buried next to him as well in Guavavi. His, his son, of course, was a miscreant, and this was something we've seen elsewhere on the frontier of Sonora and really all across the frontier, which is that um, there was a tendency to try to promote your children to be presidio officers. And occasionally they were outstanding and, and, and impressive like uh, Anza was certainly as impressive as his father. But to be honest with you, um, Felipe's son was a really loser. And he was left in charge of, of Tucson and second in command when Anza was off you know, on his expeditions. And he embezzled the construction fee uh, monies that were available for the Presidio. And he, he also notoriously played a dirty joke on Garces during the time of the expedition. He told him that Tumacacri had been destroyed as a practical joke. Um, and in the various inspection papers I've looked, it's quite clear that he was a person ill-suited to being a commander of any sort. Um, now, what did it do with these people? They were socially so prominent, you couldn't court-martial them or fire them, so to speak, and just let them go. So what they used to do was rotate them to staff duty, um, of course, in, in Arispe frequently. And um, another one of these miscreant commandantes was the commander of Santa Cruz de Terranate at the end and, and earlier at Terranate, Jose Antonio Vildosola. He, his brother Gabriel was a fine commander, but he was just awful. He bribed people. He, his, his, his garrison mutinied because he stole their pay um, and uh, no one had much good to say about them. Now, the other thing that Anza curiously in that inspection in the 1760s is reported to have one, one flaw as a commander and that was that he was too generous with his soldiers. And in particularly, of course, he, he had uh, his, his old mentor, the commandant there's uh, son serving as second in command and he was, Ruby could see he wasn't really fit for command. But that was a constant problem on the frontier because the socially prominent people could not easily be just simply um, done away with and, and, and dismissed from military service. And uh, they didn't really know exactly what to do with them. But my impression is that, like I said, they rotated them to staff duty. And it's often the case that their other relatives are working hard from Mexico City to the frontier, trying to get them back into positions of command. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Chuck is asking, are there any plans for future excavations, such as the old church site uh, that you're aware of? Oh, not to, not to my knowledge. Um, 
it would definitely be worth investigating the the area immediately around the church. Um, I think you could probably, I bet that St. Anne's isn't exactly right on top of the footings of the earlier structure. Um, there was a project while I was working there that was a call for creating a trench, a utility trench across the cemetery. Um, and they started that and I managed, thanks to Bob Barncastle, I got there and was able to have a chat with them. And, and once the workers realized they were digging in a cemetery, they stopped. So that trench was never completed, but um, it did provide evidence that there, the walled cemetery area shown on the Rukia map is in fact there. Um, and so that area, which is in front of modern day St. Anne's should provide a wonderful amount of information from the burial data there someday when people get around to, to looking at it. The original yeah. mission of the chapel, I have no idea where that was, but my guess is it's probably in the South Barrio given that we found that one structure that was um, pre-Presidio era. And that building, by the way, was definitely a historic structure. It wasn't a prehistoric structure. Uh, south of the South Barrio, there's a huge prehistoric site, very similar to what De Peso describes as um, in Tumacacri. That's the same sort of a site. But the, uh, there was a scattering of prehistoric late Hokam artifacts in the area, but it was quite clear that both the North and Barrio areas were not the major focus of uh, Holcom or uh, late proto-historic settlements. There was not, no clear evidence of anything earlier like that. Thank you, Jack. Uh, any other questions perhaps from anyone we haven't heard from so far? Awesome. Well, we're almost at three o'clock, almost at the hour mark. Um, I wanted to thank you, Jack, for taking the time and for the excellent uh, presentation. There's so uh, little information uh, about early Tubac that's really uh, spread out into the public, and so it, it's such a it was so gratifying to to kind of get this window of life uh, into early uh, Tubac history. Uh, so thank you so much. Oh, it was my pleasure to, to do it. And I always enjoy talking about Tubac. Uh, little by little, I'm working towards the uh, objective of getting a final publication. Of course, part of the complexity of that is my health hasn't been too good, so it's made it more challenging. And I, I have a huge number of really of projects to kind of push towards that final goal of, of publications. A small amount of the results have been published, but as a whole, the detailed stuff is yet to be done. Fantastic. Um, we, we had a question here from Jose, if it's possible to get a copy of the presentation. Yes, we've recorded it and we'll upload it onto BCA's YouTube uh, channel and uh, Vimeo channel as well. So for, for future reference, you can you can uh, access this great presentation there uh, as well. You might awesome. enjoy uh, uh -huh. subscribing to the Facebook group page, uh, Northern New Spain, which Alex and I uh, administer. And it's, it is a definitely a place you'll find more information occasionally about Tubac, but all across the Northern frontier and various things that are uh, remains from archeology span to literature, to the general culture, and to comparative information on, on other frontiers. So you might enjoy going there if you came to hear this particular presentation. Yes, thank you for, for reminding me. I'll, I'll put it here in the chat um, for you guys to look it up. It's on Facebook. Um, uh, Jack founded the group and uh, I'm also his help help out with administering on the group and it's a, a great group where a lot of information is shared. Um, so if you search that you should be able to to find it on on Facebook as well. So Awesome. Well, if there's anything too that I can do to help you with uh, the publications, please uh, let us know and um, I, I would love to help, you know, in the decimation of, of this information, all of this valuable information that you've that your life's work has collected, uh, Jack. I, I remember you being excavating the Lavanderia in San, Mission San Luis Rey as well, too. Another uh, fantastic site, the, the Mission Laundry, the brick laundry there um, as well. So. Now, some of, those, um, some of those reports are available digitally now because I put them up on, through through uh, Northern New Spain. So if you go back to the archive of that, you can find, for example, the report I wrote on the Lavenderia. Yeah. 
um, which was a, I have to tell you, it is really dramatic how, how different uh, San Luis Rey is from uh, like Colonial Tubac because the, the amount of architectural elaboration there is just so much more extensive than it is in, in, in the Northern frontier and the Pima Rialta. Um, it's interesting because the, you know, the, the same settlers were living in essentially the same settlers in, in both places. Um, but the quality of life must have been drastically different. Um, and uh, it is amazing how much variability there was over the frontier as a whole mm -hmm. from region to region. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I hope you'll you join us in the future again for another presentation on another related topic uh, because as I can see from the comments, everybody has such uh, nice things to say. Terrific presentation. Thank you for this. Fascinating. Uh, so uh, thank you again, Jack. And, and thank you for joining us from Indiana and sending you lots of warm greetings from, from Tubac out, out your way. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. So thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.